we have now calculated by a direct method, you can call it brute force, although there is some elegance in it, the order characteristic of all the spheres. You might wonder, and you should indeed be wondering, what the order characteristic of any manifold that we have encountered is. You know, we have encountered many other examples of manifolds, especially in the first week. You remember? Torus, real projective plane, sigma g, ng, and so on and so on. And in the future, you might encounter other manifolds, such as the Lie groups, and so on. Yet one more remark about this um, problem of um, the order characteristic of spheres. Let's take a sphere, and this is S2. Okay? We said partition. Partition means just draw some pictures and divide the picture into, you know, curves, lines, and points, and faces. What about something like this? I drew two circles on the sphere. Okay? I drew two circles. Well, it looks like beta zero. How many vertices are there? Well, there are no vertices. Right? It's zero. Beta one. Well, how many edges are there? I seem to see two curves. One, two. Right? And how many faces are there? Well, there is this face, there is this face, and then there is the face on the, on the rest. So there we seem to have three. So this, if we do that, we get one. Okay? And that's not equal to what we thought we discovered, which is the order characteristic of all even dimensional spheres should be 2. So what's wrong here? We got the wrong answer. We got the wrong answer because we are forgetting um, this clause. And bless you. Each of the faces, when you do this partitioning, each of the cells must be homeomorphic to the ball of the corresponding dimension. For example, well, there are lots and lots of things wrong with this partition. This partition is illegal. Yes? Because the edges what we seem to be thinking as edges, which uh, look like this, yeah, is not homeomorphic to B1. What's B1? It's a segment. It's not a segment, it's a circle. Not the same thing. Also, the faces, you have a face like this, right? That's one of the things that we call the face, but that's not homeomorphic to B2, which is a disk. It has a hole in it. So this partitioning, so-called partitioning, is illegal. When you partition to draw a network, you must make sure that every vertex is a point, every edge is topologically a segment, and every face is topologically a disk, and so on. And every face should be a ball of that dimension. dimension. For example, you see this face is, it has corners and so on, but topologically a disk. If you draw an illegal partition, illegal network, then the numbers will come out wrong. Okay? Now, I'd like to give, although all the projects are due today, I, apparently, well, I might as well give you some exercise and um, projects. You don't have to do this if you run out of time, because I think AIM students don't sleep enough. Um, bless you, sir. Um, maybe whenever you hear assignment, you sneeze too. I mean, somebody has the same property. But um, these facts are very useful to know, so I just take them, and you can either prove them for yourselves, submit them as projects, or you can believe them, or you can come to me and I'll show you how to do them. Okay, so first project 
correct result is that for any manifolds, manifolds M1 and M2 of the same dimension, <coughs> dimension, let's call the dimension M. What happens, you might wonder, when you take the connected sum of M1 and M2? Do you remember this funny symbol from the first week? Connected sum. You can have two manifolds of the same dim dimension and you can just pipe them together if you like. Yeah? Well, it turns out that this is quite easy. To a good approximation, it is the sum of the order characteristics, but not quite. You have to have the correction, and the correction is minus the order characteristic of S M minus 1, one dimension down. And we know what those are depending on M. We have the answers already. And then minus minus 1 M times 2. You might guess where this 2 comes from. There is some ball involved, and you are removing those balls and so on. Anyway, this is a formula. If you want to calculate the order characteristic of the connected sum or surgery of two manifolds, then you can write it down in terms of the each um, individual component. Okay. <laughs> Not component, but half. Okay, so that's one. Also, you can prove that first. Also, by direct calculation or direct picture, you can check that the order characteristic for a two-dimensional torus, T2, is equal to zero. And that order characteristic for the, what did you call this uh, space? Real projective plane turns out to be, if you do the, um, just the picture drawing, one. If you know these two things, torus and the projective plane, well, you can calculate in principle the Euler characteristics of all the sigma g's and all the ng's. Because sigma g's and ng's are just connected sums of tori and real projective planes. And hence, using the, that additive addition formula and the starting point of the induction, you should be able to prove easily that I write too hard on the blackboard. It doesn't erase nicely. But if I don't write hard enough, people in the back cannot see. So it's difficult. And hence that the order characteristic of sigma g is quite, this is quite famous, 2 minus 2g. You find this number coming up in many areas of mathematics. And what is not so widely known is that order characteristic of all the non-orientable surfaces, which you can get by um, connected sum um, RPs, is equal to 2 minus G. You should check, by the way, that these make sense. When G is 1, that's just a torus. So it should give you 0 when G is 1, which it does. When G is 1, what's N1? It's the project plane itself. So that should give you 1, which it also does. So, in this exercise of the project, what's interesting is this statement. This formula is interesting, and you can prove it easily by drawing a picture. You have to look at the picture of the connected sum, and then somehow draw a network on it, which makes clear the dependence on the order characteristic of one piece and the other piece, and then what's happening in between. And also, of interest is those two formulae. That's easy to do by drawing a diagram again. And the rest, from here to here, that's just an algebraic reduction. There's no brain work in it. Anybody can do it. OK. Another exercise. But I'd like to think, think of these two projects as part of the same project. Let's prove. Also, please prove, rather, that for manifolds, again, M1 and M2, but this time, not necessarily of the same dimension. They can be of any dimension. 
They could be of the same dimension, but they don't have to. Not necessarily of the same dimension. No dimensional restriction. You might wonder, what's the next thing you wonder? You can, you have a formula for the sum of manifolds. You should have a formula for, huh? We are calculating the Euler characteristic for various operations. We wanted to know what happens to the Euler characteristic when you add manifolds. What's next? Okay. When you multiply manifolds. Exactly. So we want to find out what the Euler characteristic is of the product of manifolds in terms of the Euler characteristics of each. And this massively is very easy. It turns out to be the Euler characteristic times the other Euler characteristic. OK, maybe you can write it times. So the Euler characteristic is, if you like, a homomorphism or the isomorphism under multiplication. Once you know this, and you know the Euler characteristic of a circle, you should be able to deduce easily that the Euler characteristic of torus in any dimension is equal to zero. Tremendously easy exercise and deduction from here to here. OK. We are about to have the yellow card. As I said, if you are looking for some other projects to do, assignments to do, those two would be a very good one. But if you are already too tired because it's the third week um, and you'd rather take it easy, eating ice cream and so on, um, don't bother. But these two things are very useful to know and you should have them in your records. Okay. Yes? When are they due? Huh? When are they due? I don't know. Well, officially, all the assignments are due this evening, but OK, you can, you can give them to us maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Who knows it. But you have other assignments, so don't lose sleep. I know that you like to sleep only four hours a night, but, like Napoleon, but you, know, you should sleep a little more. And don't worry too much. You have already done a uh, lot of work. OK. Okay. After all this, we shall now come to the main result of this chapter. And like many results, main results, it's attached to names of great mathematicians. One of them is Poincaré. You should know this name if you have not heard it before. Um, one of the most influential mathematicians of all time. He lived around the turn of the 20th century, from the um, latter half of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, Henri Poincaré. His uh, cousin was Raymond Poincaré, the president of the French Republic. But this is really the more famous one. And this theorem that I'm about to state was proved by, discovered by Poincaré in the two-dimensional case in 1881. And then Heinz Hopf, a nice Swiss mathematician, proved it in general dimension in 1926. So for this reason, it's sometimes called the poincare hopf theorem. Theorem says the following. Suppose that you have a closed orientable manifold. Closed. Then, for any vector field, for every, sorry, I think it's every vector field, V, on M, we have that the familiar number index of V at X, where X sums over all the equilibria, is equal to a beautiful answer. We say that this number does not depend on the choice of the vector field. It depends only on information concerning M. And we raised the question about uh, 20, 30 minutes ago. Can we write it down directly in terms of the information about M? The answer is yes. 
it is equal to the Euler characteristic of n. Beautiful result. In particular, we see that, you see, when we defined m, chi, chi, we made lots of choices, you know, decomposition or partitioning into this form or this form, depending on who's drawing the picture, beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, all those numbers change. But we are claiming that all the characteristic does not depend on the way you partition. This proves it because the right hand side seems to be defined in terms of some picture we've drawn, network we've drawn, but the left hand side knows nothing about what network we're drawing. You see, each time we have a vector field, we can calculate this. So, left hand side obviously does not depend on any network of any kind. So, this must be independent of the choices we have made. But we can read the equation backwards. If you want to show that this number does not depend on the vector field, we look at this and say, oh, if that's true, the right hand side depends on the, on the network that we have drawn. There's no mention of vector field. So clearly, this is independent of the choice of the vector field and so on. Anyway, so this is one conclusion we can immediately see, that the Euler characteristic <coughs> is well-defined. Well-defined means that you don't get different answers depending on different pictures we draw. Independently, this is E, as you know, of how we partition, or how we network, how we partition M into what well, network. That was an issue, a problem that was left over from the definition of the order characteristic itself, which was definition 13. Okay. Okay. Poincaré Hopf's theorem. We shall finish this class by proving that theorem, which is not, in fact, too difficult. Though the theorem is not too difficult to prove, it has many, many applications. You might remember that the Brauer fixed point theorem had many applications. This has almost as many, which makes me comment that the usefulness and even the beauty of a mathematical result does not depend really so much on its difficulty. Some people believe that the more difficult the result, the better it is, but that's not true. Really, the best kind of results, the most useful kind, are easy ones that have many applications. So I hope that in your careers you'll be looking for easy mathematics, but which are useful, useful, and so on. Proof. Um, we will do this proof in dimension two. Okay? Now, you see that the picture that I'm drawing is very easily generalizable. So, I'm going to do it in dimension two in order to keep it simple but it's easy to rewrite this in any dimension. All the other dimensions are the same. So other dimensions are analogous. You just follow your nodes. Okay. How do we do this? First, please remember that when we are calculating the left-hand side, from now on, I shall call left-hand side this number, this sum, right-hand side this number, the order characteristic. Please recall that this left-hand side, we already know, does not depend on the choice of V. In other words, we can calculate this left-hand side by choosing any V we like. In that case, let's not choose a complicated V. Let's choose a very simple V. Yeah? But not so simple that um, the, all the equilibria degenerate. We have to make sure that the equilibria are very nicely behave, they are generic. So here is the V that we shall choose, and we shall prove that the result for that V. So first, by corollary 12, um, 
the left hand side the abbreviation is LHS left hand side it's quite common and because the left hand side is very long to write you often write LHS um, it's not large hadron something or other um, can be calculated using any any V we like. Okay, so we shall take the following V. First, let's on M, our surface, draw a network. Okay. And we shall draw a network which might look like this, which might look like this, which might look like this, like that, and then which might look like this. Okay, and so on. We draw some network. Okay. Next, I'm going to copy this network. Excuse me. This is supposed to be the same picture as this picture. So let me draw the same picture, or what I think should look like the same picture. You see, if I draw a very complicated picture, I cannot draw the same picture again. So it's, um, I think maybe I should start somewhere here. Yeah, this looks a bit more like the same picture. Um, I hope this looks like the same picture to everyone. Does it look like the same picture? Well, almost. Okay. Now, draw a network and place the following objects at each vertex a source of a vector field. Do you remember what the source is? It's the equilibrium where the flow is coming out of. At each mid edge, that is the midpoint of the edge, please put the saddle. You remember what the saddle is? That's the place, uh, an equilibrium where the flow is coming in one direction but going out in the other direction. Yeah? And finally, at each mid face, that is the midpoint of each face, a sink. Okay, sink is the point, equilibrium where all the flow is coming in. Well, what does that become? Let's draw these, give them colors. Source will be yellow, and saddle will be red. I'm not choosing the colors very carefully, I'm sorry. There might be some better color coding scheme. For example, you might have green, yellow, red, like the... Um, lights of a traffic light, or as they say in South Africa, a robot. Um, anyway, so those are the colors, okay? So, let's see. At each vertex, I put the source. In other words, this water, if you like, is coming out of each of these points. Okay? And in the middle of each face, let's do the sinks, it's going down at those points. Okay, I'm not going to draw everywhere. And then, at the middle of each vertex, uh, each edge, I put a saddle. So saddles are indicated by, by red crosses, like this. And what we do is then fill the rest of the picture. picture with a suitable flow, flow of the vector field. What do I mean? You know, it's not too difficult to see what's going to happen. For example, let's look at this edge. There's a source, the water is coming out from here, and there's a source, water is coming out of here, so the water must be going this way. But that's a saddle. Which means that if the water is coming in in this direction, it must be going out in that other direction, so that it must go out like this. You know what I'm doing? But that's lucky because this is a sink. Water should be going into this. Similarly here, water should be coming out of the sources, but in the middle, there's a saddle, so water goes out in this direction. And here, similarly, you get that kind of picture, you get that kind of picture. Well, 
Having completed this part, what do you think will the flow of the water in this region look like? Well, it's clear. Water goes like this, and it flows like this. And in the middle, it flows straight. So we have now filled this part of the picture in a pretty much unique way. And similarly, for any other part of the picture. So this is a sink, so it's squirting out water in all directions. Hmm? But that's a saddle. This is a, so water should come out here because it's going in this direction. And because towards this saddle it's going in, it should come out in this direction. And here, therefore, I can feel the picture like this. Here I can feel the picture like this. Here I can feel the picture like this. And as for here, yes, you guessed, I can feel the picture like this, and so on. So you can feel the flow everywhere. Is that okay? So this way, given any network, I can draw a vector field. Given any network, I can draw a vector field. And we are saying, let's use that particular vector field to calculate the index. I know that that number we get at the end is independent of the choice of the vector field, so that is this number. And we shall see if that number has anything to do with the Euler characteristic. It turns out that it does. Because, let's recall ex example 9. Do you remember what indices, sources, and sinks have in dimension 2? Huh? They contribute. What was the index plus or minus one? For source, zero. For sink, yeah. plus or minus. Yeah, so for saddles, it was zero. For source and sink, uh, sorry, not zero, actually minus one. Saddles, minus one. Sink and source, plus two, uh, plus, plus one. So sink and source, source and sinks contribute plus one, while Saddles contribute minus one each on two dimensional in dimension two. Um, okay, on two dimensional surface. You should look back at the calculation of example nine and check this. So, what do we have? The left hand side, always of that for that, we have to add up all the indices with plus and minuses. Well, how many sinks are there? Sorry, how many sources are there? Exactly as many as the number of vertices. Right? So this is, of course, the number of vertices, but also it's the number of sources. And they contribute plus one. Okay? That's the index contributed by each of the sources. Okay? Plus. How many um, saddles are there? Well, there are exactly as many saddles as the number of edges. That's beta two. Each saddle contributes minus one. That's the index of the saddle. So I have to add, add that to the previous result. And finally, how many sinks are there? As many as there are, many, there are faces. But that's beta 2. And each sink contributes, what's the index it contributes? Plus 1. So I have to add that to the previous result. And if you look at what we get, it's beta 0 minus beta 1 plus beta 2. That's exactly the Euler characteristic, which is the right-hand side. End of proof. Nice, huh? I hope that you understand the logic of this um, calculation. Okay, 
So we have now proved, thank you, and this is the end. Um, good timing, in fact, not good timing, it's too, too long. Oh, that's, uh, you should have something in red so that you can, it's really red. So we have now proved Poincaré Hopf, and we shall see tomorrow when we start that this can be used in, again, two different ways. This great theorem, which says left hand side equals right hand side, can be used in the following ways. Way number one, you can say, oh, we don't know what the left hand side is, but we know what the right hand side is, so let's find out what the left is from the right. That's one way to do it. Another way is, oh, we don't know what the right hand side is, but we know what the left hand side is, so we, let's figure out right from left. It can work in both ways, and we'll see many examples tomorrow.